In the last lecture, I showed how, within the human organism, something which is actually like a retransmutation of forces takes place, and that this has even extended to the dense physical body. As an example, I pointed out that from our heart and blood system proceeds continually a kind of etherization of the coarse physical substance of the blood, so that in its finest parts the blood is continually passing over into the same substance as that of which the etheric body of man consists. And we have seen that these etheric particles stream upward continually from the heart and permeate the brain. And moreover, that it depends on the permeation of our brain by these newly organized portions of our etheric body that we are able to develop a knowledge and understanding that surpasses the egoistic knowledge of what takes place within ourselves, within our own organism. I tried to explain that if these etheric streams did not pass upward from the heart to the brain, only those concepts and ideas and feelings could pass through the instrument of the brain which had to do with our own body, with our own organism. What I thus laid before you is connected with the whole course of man's development. We have to keep firmly before us the fact that in the beginning the evolution of our earth was preceded by the Saturn, Sun and Moon evolution, that these had produced results, and that these led during the pre Lemurian age to the earth's formation excuse me, of the earth's formation to an etheric man. Before entering on his Lemurian development, man, even as regards his physical forces, was only an etheric form. In the pre-Lemurian age, there was as yet no such dense physical man as we have today, with his dense physical blood, nerve system, bony system, etc. All the forces which exist in the physical body today were present then only in their etheric form. This etheric human form was shadowy and phantom-like compared with the later man, and gave but an indication of what later crystallized from it as the denser man. This densification only took place throughout the Lemurian, the Atlantean, and the post-Atlantean times. In order thoroughly to understand, quote, the wonders of the world, the trials of the soul, and the revelations of the spirit, close quote, we must keep in mind this taking on of form by man, and how he gradually became solidified from what had been originally a shadowy form. Let us now try to understand and picture symbolically to ourselves what a human being was like in pre-Lemurian times. He was then a kind of phantom, giving only an indication of the later human form. Into this human phantom the most varied streams of influence entered, and the beings of the higher hierarchies worked within it. At that time man did not walk about on the earth with his feet, but hovered as a shadowy form in the periphery of the earth. It was only later that he descended. The earth itself was indeed in a much less dense condition at that time. Everything that the higher hierarchies wrought on man streamed in upon him in all kinds of currents. While man lived on the earth in this shadowy form, the earth also was evolving and was by no means that mass of dense matter that geologists, mineralogists and physicists describe. To describe the earth as physicists and mineralogists do is much the same as to describe a man by only describing his skeleton. What physical science describes is only a part, the scaffolding of the earth. Quite other forces are bound up with the earth and quite other substances which make of the earth an organism in which we are embedded. The development of the earth continued and from the earth itself there streamed to men continuous and ever-changing forces throughout the course of the Lemurian, Atlantean and post-Atlantean evolution. Let us now imagine these forces more closely. We must first observe certain forces which, through the spiritual beings of the higher hierarchies, 
belong, as it were, to the subterrestrial streams which I mentioned in the preceding lecture. These forces streamed into men, and indeed were we to describe this process in terms of space, we should say that these forces were directed from below, from the earth upward. Throughout the course of earthly evolution, man is permeated from below by the forces of the higher hierarchies. And if we want to speak regarding the external things of science, and also of spiritual science, we are forced to say, the forces which streamed into into man, especially during the Lemurian age, and continuously after that, and assisted at his formation, were forces which in accordance with their nature worked through the earth. Wherever on the surface of the earth man may be, these forces are present. These forces, which had yet another task to accomplish in earthly evolution, we will, in the first place, make comprehensible by directing our attention to beings of another kingdom, in whose formation these forces were specially active. Zoologists and naturalists will someday be astounded to see in what a complicated manner everything has been formed from out the spiritual world. Things which they now represent so simply, so prettily, I might say, in their books, in what from a certain side is a quite correct genealogical tree. Things they consider as nearly related have in some cases arisen through the most complicated spiritual influences coming from the most varied sides. As a matter of fact, we absolutely must not represent what zoology terms mammals in the way external Darwinistic zoology does today. We must by no means think that any direct line can be drawn from the simplest to the most complicated of the mammals. In two different kinds of mammals, we find that entirely different constructive forces are employed. All the mammals we have around us that are related in some way to our ruminants, especially to our domestic animals, stand under quite other spiritual conditions in the course of evolution than those belonging to the feline tribe. We must picture this to ourselves in such a way that we see how spiritual forces worked first on the group souls and through them on the physical forms. What appertains to the lion-like or feline animals first began to work upon the earth toward the beginning of, and especially during, the Atlantean age and approached the earth as if sent outward from the inner part of the earth to the surface. Everything, however, effecting man himself during the Lemurian age is related to that which worked constructively upon our ruminating animals and is comprised esoterically in the symbol of the bull. All this began to effect man in the Lemurian age, it participated in his formation, worked upon the human structure as if from the inner part of the earth to the surface. It must not appear especially shocking when I say that if other influences had not in that far-off time worked upon man, he would have had a bovine form. The way these forces worked on man would, if left to themselves, have formed him in this manner but gradually other forces began to influence the human organism, working outward from the inner part of the earth. These are the same forces that exercised their special influence on the other type of mammals, and are summed up esoterically under the name of the lion. They intervened somewhat later in human development. If the earlier forces had not been there, and if these forces alone had worked on man, his external form would have been lion-like, with all the special characteristics of the lion organism. The very complicated form of man has arisen through the fact that he was effected not by one outpouring, but by different successive streams of influence. You can now form some idea why bovine animals have remained bovine, and lion-like animals have become lion-like. The reason is that the phantom-like schematic forms that were basic to them were not organized in the same way as were the pre-Lemurian phantom-like forms of the then human beings.
These phantom-like forms were so organized through their preceding Saturn, Sun, and Moon evolutions that they ever awaited the right moment. They allowed the varied succeeding outpourings to work upon them so that one current might be modified by the other and might also in the higher sense be harmonized by it. A bull would not remain a bull if the lion nature worked upon him and transformed his bull form. Man approached the earth in such a way that all these outpourings have been permitted to work upon him. And it was only in the course of the Atlantean period that something else intervened, something that, when it is once recognized and made fruitful for external science, will throw infinite light upon our natural history. In the course of the Atlantean period, quite other conditions came about. Mark carefully that I said these bovine and leonine forces worked as if streaming from the inner part of the earth toward the surface. The forces, which during the Atlantean period united with these, came now from outside, from the periphery of the earth, as it were. So throughout all the Atlantean period such forces were active as we might think of as entering into and working formatively on man from below upward, and others working out of space from above downward into man. At this time that shadowy outline of man was exposed to yet other forces, working upon him from another and quite opposite direction. In order to form an idea of these forces, we must ask ourselves, into what kind of creatures on earth did they continually send down their influence out of cosmic space, undisturbed by any other forces? Here we can point to certain creatures in the surroundings of the earth on whom the bovine and feline forces, coming from the inner part of the earth, had the least possible effect. On the other hand, the forces streaming down out of cosmic space upon the earth's substance were almost exclusively at work in their case. These creatures are those belonging to the bird kingdom. Our abstract zoology will one day be astounded when it has to acknowledge that the forces which chiefly affect the bird kingdom and in a wider sense of the word everything also that procreates its kind by the laying of eggs are really quite differently constituted from those affecting mammals. Thus among all the living creatures whose procreation of species is carried out in this manner, especially in the bird kingdom, the forces chiefly at work on their structure are those pouring in from outer space and are summed up in esotericism under the name of eagle. When we think of these forces which find expression in the construction of the denizens of bird world and seek to harmonize them with the leonine and bovine forces in man, so that all are blended in the original schematic or outlined form of man, we have in this harmonious blend that which results in the human form today. When you consider the totally different formation of the bird creation, you will not long be able to doubt that the whole structure of the bird is essentially different from that of the mammal, for instance. I need not today speak further of the other animal kingdoms, but in the structure of the bird there lies something that impresses clairvoyant vision in a quite remarkable manner. In observing the mammalia clairvoyantly, we always find the astral body quite specially developed. But what strikes us most in observing the bird world clairvoyantly is the etheric body. It is the etheric body stimulated from without by the forces pouring inward from cosmic space that produces the plumage of the birds. All this is formed from without. A bird's feather can only come into being through the fact that the forces working down from cosmic space upon the earth and cooperating in the construction of the feathers of birds are stronger than the forces proceeding from the earth. That which is fundamental to the feather, the quill, is certainly subject to the forces proceeding out of the earth, but then it is the forces which work out of space which give ordered sequence to that which is affiliated with the shaft of the feather and which constitutes the external plumage of the bird. 
it is quite otherwise with the creatures that are covered with hair. In the hair, those forces mainly at work whose action is from the earth outward, and thus they have the opposite direction to those working in the feathers of the bird. Because the forces operative from universal space are able only to work upon the hair of animals and men in a more restricted way, hair cannot become feather, if I may use such a paradoxical expression, which, however, entirely corresponds with reality. And, were one to carry the paradox still further, one might say, every feather has the tendency to become a hair, but is not hair, because the forces of cosmic space work from all sides to make it feather. Every hair has the tendency to become a feather, and yet no hair does become a feather, because the forces which work from the earth outward are stronger than the forces which work inward from without. When such paradoxes as these are kept seriously before us, we arrive at certain fundamental secrets regarding the constitution of our cosmos. Let us suppose that a person with the old kind of clairvoyance wanted to describe not the human being, who only spoils the different currents that flow to him by harmonizing them within himself and revealing them only in their reciprocated effect. But let us suppose that he wanted simply to make these different streams visible. He would have had to say, there is something at the very foundation of man that cannot be seen physically. This is the original archetype or foreshadowed form which today only emerges in the external physical form of man, because in it he has harmonized what is called the eagle, bull, and lion outpourings. Anyone who considers man throughout his whole evolutionary course must hold the original plan or foreshadowed form of man as supersensible. But in order to do so, he would have to separate one from another those forces which had flowed together in man, he would have to realize that the whole of the development of man is based on an etheric archetype into which has flowed and mingled so that in the complete man of the present day they can no longer be distinguished a bull, a lion and bird element. Let us suppose that some such epoch of civilization as that of ancient Egypt had endeavored to place before mankind the whole vast enigmatic question of human evolution, the real man, the original archetypal form, which had come down as the result of the Saturn sun and moon evolution, would of necessity have to remain invisible. But out of the invisible would have to be constructed a compound figure, composed of the forms of the bull and the lion, with wings such as an eagle has, or in any case such as a bird has. When you recall the form of the Sphinx in its widest meaning, which was intended to represent to us the great riddle of man's development, you actually have what such a civilization, gifted with clairvoyance and aware of the inner side of things concerning humanity, desired to place before this humanity. That which appeared distinct in the Sphinx is intimately interwoven with human nature. And one can say that, to clairvoyant sight, the human form has a very strange appearance. When one takes such a sphinx, as is actually composed of a lion form or a bull form with wings, and allows it to work upon the clairvoyant sense, supplementing it with that which stands behind it as human archetype or shadow form, when inwardly one interweaves these, there arises before us the human form of the present day. Hence clairvoyant consciousness cannot look at a sphinx, which at first has no resemblance to a human being, without inwardly saying, quote, that am I myself, close quote. Now in the course of these studies, something very remarkable has been said. We have thrown light on the four-membered being of man from a new standpoint. An archetypal or foreshadowed form, esoterically called man, has been handed on as the result of the Saturn sun and moon evolution. In the process of the condensation of this archetypal form, those spiritual streams of influence have been at work 
which are described esoterically as the bull, the lion, and the eagle. Here we have four esoteric symbols which together actually compose man, and which are most deeply and most significantly concerned with human evolution. We have mentioned that in the course of human evolution on the earth, in man himself, as also in other creatures, especially in the bird creation, forces have participated which worked from without, from cosmic space. This actually occurred during the Atlantean age, so that one can say, into those parts of the human organization to which the normal consciousness of man does not any longer extend, there entered a stream of influence out of cosmic space. This stream existed in Atlantean times, and naturally it existed also in post-Atlantean times. It was that current which issued from the sphere which I designated in the preceding chapter as that of the upper gods, the gods who in a certain way are the conceptions or ideas of the subterrestrial or Chthonian gods. Chthonian is C-H-T-H-O-N-I-A-N, Chthonian gods. These are entities who were encountered by those disciples of the Greek mysteries who had to approach the great riddle of the Sphinx. They had to regard the subconscious part of man so that from the point of view of self-knowledge they arrived also at the fourfold partition of humanity. This, which had poured out of cosmic space into the subconsciousness of man since the Atlantean period, and which had penetrated him even to his inferior parts, now entered earthly evolution in man's most highly purified parts at the baptism by John in Jordan. That was truly a very significant event. At that time those forces entered in their purest essence, not only into the subconscious part of man, but so that his consciousness was ever more and more able to participate in them. They were forces which, since the Atlantean age, have worked continually from out the cosmos upon our earth and upon the human structure of man. Therefore that figure had to appear, which is the greatest among all the great symbols that have come down to us in the occult and sacred writings, the symbol which we find in the Gospels. How is it possible to represent this inpouring from above out of cosmic space in its purest form? We know what took place in the baptism by John. We know that at that time the three principles of the body of Jesus of Nazareth which had been prepared through the two Jesus children, as you find in my little book titled The Spiritual Guidance of Man and of Mankind, were forsaken by its ego, which was the ego Zarathustra. This ego streamed upward, and at its exit there entered into the body of Jesus the purest part of that stream which already had continuously poured forth from cosmic space, though only into the members that are today subconscious in man. Consequently, the correct symbol of a bird form was given, the form of a pure white dove, which represents the purest extract of that which was the, in quotes, eagle or cherub nature of the figure of the Sphinx. It is vital to the perfecting of humanity on earth that this cosmic current should flow into the conscious part of man, In the picture of Jesus of Nazareth by the Jordan, surmounted by the dove, we find the actual expression of the mystery, which had now come to a small number of people. In the last lecture we were able to trace somewhat the history of this stream from cosmic space. Why was this cosmic stream of influence able to formulate itself so that it became the Christ force, the impulse of Christ? which by working ever more and more on the earth will permeate and entirely fill the nature of man. By taking this impulse more and more into his inner being, man will feel within him more and more the truth of the saying of Paul, not I but Christ in me. Compared with the three other outpourings, which were the result of an earlier evolution, the new stream, the purest of all those coming from above, will ever more and more take possession of man, will ever more and more surround him, and will detach him more and more from that which binds him to the earth. 
In the preceding lecture we described the historical development of this stream and said it was only possible for it to become such as it was through its having been already prepared on the old sun. Whereas the super-terrestrial divine beings, who, as explained yesterday, are the conceptions or thoughts of other divine beings, wanted to live only in the finer elements, in the elements of warmth and light, in the chemical and life elements. This being who, later on descended at the baptism in Jordan, brought with him, out of his intrinsic wisdom, the forces to which our evolution had already progressed during the old sun evolution. We know from occult science that during the old sun evolution there had already taken place that condensation of the element of heat into the element of air, which was the most essential thing on ancient Saturn. Whereas the other beings of the superterrestrial divine worlds did not concern themselves with taking anything of the nature of air with them at their departure from collective evolution into cosmic space, this being took with him the element of air. He thus remained in relationship with the earth, so that throughout all coming evolution, because of this being, an element existed in cosmic space that was related to the earth, namely that which had already condensed itself on the old sun to air or gas. If we could look out into space with the eye of ancient Zoroaster, and behold the sun as he beheld it, we should see in it first a remnant, a revival, as it were, of the old sun. We would see it imitating that which took place on the old sun. Thus, according to occult science, we have to see in the sun the dwelling place, or at least the most important part of the dwelling place, for the rest of our planets belong also to this dwelling place, of the upper godlike forms introduced to you yesterday as forming the one stream of divine influence from the world of the gods. If, however, you observe this whole sun with clairvoyant sight, everything of which these upper gods consist is present in the sun, only etherically, from the heat elements outward as light ether, chemical and life ether. But the sun as it exists in space today is not only present to clairvoyant vision as an etheric form, but it is there as a globe of gas, as something that has been condensed as far as to the condition of air. The sun would never have become condensed as far as to the substance of air if during the old sun evolution that being of whom I spoke in the preceding lecture and who came down again with the dove at the baptism by John and Jordan had not separated himself from the earth not only in an etheric body, but in a body of air. Thus, when we look at the sun, we have to say to ourselves, those impulses which in the sun are impulses of warmth and of light, that are chemical and life impulses, are connected with those other beings, who are but the conceptions in the lower gods. But all that is of the nature of gas or air in the sun is really the body of Christ. By realizing things such as these, science, which today is so materialistic, will learn once more the ancient teaching of Zarathustra, will again have to acknowledge that the sun as a globe of gas in cosmic space is not only that which our astrochemistry desires to make of it, not merely that which our spectral analysis discovers, but the sun as a globe of gas or air in outer cosmic space is the original body of Christ who was associated with the upper gods, but was also one of those divine beings who was connected with the life of the earth. That was perceived by Zarathustra when he gave expression to the mystery of the Christ in the sun in the following words, Ahura Mazda, the great spirit of wisdom, the mighty wisdom, the mighty aura. In fact, that which formerly was only in the sun, but was related to the nature of the earth, took up its abode in the physical, etheric, and astral bodies of Jesus of Nazareth at that mysterious and mystic moment of the baptism by John in Jordan. 
in the body of Jesus of Nazareth, the cleansed, purified stream out of cosmic space allied itself for the first time on earth with the newly formed etheric body of man, streaming with the blood from the heart to the brain. With that etheric current, which streams continuously as the finest etheric portion of the blood from the heart to the head, was united during the baptism by John in Jordan, that other stream, which entered out of cosmic space and was permeated with actual air substance. Through this it first became possible for every human soul to permeate itself with that element out of the cosmic space represented for us in the sign manual of the dove at the baptism by John in Jordan. A correspondence was actually created at that moment between the whole cosmos, insofar as it is accessible to us, and its purest extract, which had previously, temporarily one might say, taken part in what is esoterically called the eagle current. It was an interplay, a cooperation, between everything composing the earth current, which operated upward from beneath upon the construction of the human body, and that which, as a macrocosmic current, worked upon man from outside. From this you can see how we must enter ever more and more deeply into the mystery of Palestine. The more progress we ourselves make in knowledge of what the world is, the greater is our understanding of the mystery of Palestine. We must now ask ourselves the question, why in these days man no longer sees anything of this? Why he no longer perceives anything at all of the etheric streams which flow from his heart toward his brain? Modern science is superficial. Therefore it also regards history in a manner that is superficial to the highest degree and frequently accepts primeval truths as primeval errors. Were you to study Aristotle, you would find a remarkable teaching regarding human nature, a remarkable presentation of that, in quotes, world wonder, the human being. There you would find it stated that very fine etheric particles flow from the heart toward the head, and that where these touch the brain they are cooled, of course, modern science says, for the Greeks, Aristotle was certainly a very clever man, but nowadays every schoolboy knows that this is an error. The error, however, is on the part of those who speak thus of Aristotle. In reality, Aristotle was not possessed of that clairvoyance by which he could know anything about these things for himself. But from old traditions he knew what, in yet older times, people had been able to observe about uh, observe through natural clairvoyance. Consciousness of the etheric street currents which pass upward from the heart to the brain existed in a way far on into the Middle Ages, into the 15th and 16th centuries, and we still find a certain consciousness of this in the works of Descartes. The history of philosophy says regarding this, quote, there is certainly something that Descartes fancifully tells about the so-called life spirits which stream from the heart to the brain, but those are old notions, which happily we have left far behind. Close quote. They are not old notions at all, but old truths, springing from the time when by means of natural clairvoyance it was possible to perceive such things. In a later age the consciousness of such things was lost. How then must we represent these things from the point of view of modern clairvoyance, of modern spiritual science? For the reason that Aristotle had of necessity to draw upon tradition, because the old clairvoyant powers were no longer at his disposal, we may perhaps find the manner in which we ha he had to express these things somewhat difficult. But when, through modern esotericism, which has been available since the 13th century, one applies oneself to testing the complete nature of man, one notices that it is a fact that such an etheric stream does pass from the heart to the head. One notices also something more. It is not only an etheric stream that passes from the heart to the head, but in this stream we find that currents from the astral body are also present. So when we look more carefully at these streams, 
In turn, it turns out that there are present in them etheric parts, substances of the etheric body of man, as well as substances of the astral body of man. Thus a substance streams from the heart to the head of man, in which substantial parts of the etheric body and also of the astral body are present. Now the brain is the most remarkable instrument of human nature. It has acquired, especially because of the way it has formed itself, since the last third of the Atlantean age, the peculiar attribute of holding back that which passes upward as astral stream, of not allowing it to pass through, but it does allow the etheric stream to pass through. Let it be carefully noted. The brain as physical instrument is something which in part dams up the current passing from the heart upward to the brain. The brain is permeable as regards the etheric stream, but not permeable for the astral stream. This is retained in our brain, so that clairvoyant vision perceives that in the region of the head the astral streams passing upward from the human body and spreading out in the brain are retained there and do not get through, or do so only in the smallest degree. But these astral streams which pass upward and are retained by the brain have a certain power of attraction for the astral substances which always surround us in the astral substance of the earth. Hence the astral body of man, as met with in the region of the head, is as though knit together from two astralities, the one that which continually streams out of the cosmos, and the other that which passes from below upward in the human body and is attracted by the first. Thus the astral body that is found in close proximity to our head is somewhat thickened, and we wear it almost like a cap of astral substance. We have, an ac we have such an astral head covering due to the thickening and the knitting together of the two astral currents in the neighborhood of the head. Through this astral hood or cap, the rays of the etheric body now penetrate, for they are not held back by the brain. And the here to clairvoyant sight, the less they contain the impulses, desires, passions, and emotions of human nature. Because of this, that which we call the human aura acquires a wreath-like form when seen from the front, a circle of astral substance through which streams the rays of the etheric body. That is the head aura, still perceived in olden times by those gifted with clairvoyant vision in the case of certain personalities, in whom, owing to the purity of their nature, this part of the etheric aura was brightly radiant. This is what was really meant by the aureole of the saints and it was seen very distinctly when clairvoyant sight beheld the head aura. Thus, through the peculiar quality of the brain, we have a retention and a distribution of the inner astral rays, of the inner astral substance around the head. Please endeavor to keep this process very exactly in your minds. An etheric astral substance streams upward from below in man, this etheric astral substance spreads itself out in the brain in such a way that it fills, yet is retained, by the brain. Even as the ray of light, which falls inwardly upon the mirror, is retained and is reflected back, here you have the true, true structure of reflection. Because the astral substance is retained by the brain, it throws back its reflection, and what has entered and is reflected thus are your thoughts your conscious feelings, that which you ordinarily experience as your soul life. It is only through the fact that this astral part is united or knit together by the all-pervading etheric portion, causing the astral portion within to be connected with the outer astrality, does a knowledge of the external world come about. All knowledge of the external world comes to us through the fact that the astrality without described to you somewhat paradoxically as the astral cap or hood which every person wears, unites with the astrality within. How great are the riches which the history of civilization may yet receive through occultism! Let, remi let me remind you that in the olden times such things were seen, 
and that which was visible in the olden times, the aura, was imitated in man's dress. Headdresses were assumed because they imitated the astral cap or hood which crowns everyone. All external clothing came about originally through man's imitating in his dress that which etherically or astrally he had about him. If we wish to understand ancient vestments, especially those of the priests, if we want to know why they were in this form or in that, we need but look clairvoyantly at the things surrounding man, either as his astral or etheric aura. The formation of the etheric and astral auras were imitated in ancient garments and are still imitated in the vestments which have to do with any religious cult or ritual. It would be quite in accordance with an age, I remark this in parenthesis only, which has been so victimized by materialism that it denies the aura, were it to do away with all garments, these having originated in the imitation of that which man bears within himself. If the whim for the cult of the unclad has appeared among us today, it springs from the materialistic sense which wishes to have nothing more to do with those higher etheric and astral auric forms which a man has around him, and from which he has taken the form of his raiment. In older but not very, but not such very remote times, the colors of the aura were imitated in man's dress. Look at the pictures of early painters. Here you can still trace a consciousness of the aura in the color of the dresses and see how as a rule they represent Mary with quite a definite color of undergarment and quite a definite color of upper garment and how, for example, they use quite other colorings for the Magdalene. The Magdalene's gold-colored robe could not be exchanged by the old masters for Mary's. Why not? because the aura of a Magdalene is quite different from that of a Mary. The old painters gave full expression to this consciousness that the raiment is an expression for that which man carries about with him supersensibly as a kind of robe. You see this more especially when you look at the forms of that which the Greek gods wear, not merely as robes but as headdresses or the like. For instance, in the case of Pallas Athena and others, this depended on how the Greeks thought of the auras of the old Greek divinities. Thus, the man who presses forward to real spiritual knowledge of human nature must, must say to himself, quote, All that you see surrounding you is a, but a very superficial expression of your own true being. Close quote. When a man feels his consciousness strong within him, he must say, quote, This consciousness really comprises the very smallest part of human nature. There is something else that is continually active within me. Close quote. We might enlarge what we said in regard to the brain. When we follow up clairvoyantly the other regions of man's being, we find something in the highest degree remarkable. Whereas the etheric and astral auras extend upward to the brain, the astral aura being held back there and appearing like a halo we see the ego part of the person is held back as an inner aura in the region of the heart. The specific inner ego aura is held back in the region of the heart. It rises only as far as there and unites with some of the external parts of the corresponding macrocosmic aura. In the heart, in fact, two elements are blended. The one element enters from the macrocosmos and intermingles with the other. The ego aura, which rises from below, but stops short in the heart, is held back there. Even as the astral aura is held back in the brain, so is the ego aura held back in the heart, and there comes into contact with an external ego element. Hence the true consciousness of man does not, according to the actual facts, arise in the brain. I told you about the old Atlanteans, how their ego drew into them from without. We have to picture this still more exactly as an indrawing of the external macrocosmic ego, which since Atlantean times has progressed as far as to the heart. There it has united itself with another ego stream, which rises upward from below. In the heart these two streams meet, 
so that in the human heart we have a place organized where, through the instrumentality of the blood, the true ego of man, as seen in our consciousness, comes into being. All I have said shows how man is situated within the great macrocosmic world. If we are, in us it is. All that takes place in it takes place in us, and the normal consciousness of the man of today only grasps what every person knows, namely what lies on the surface. When you see that the, quote, cosmic wonder, close quote, man, contains something so immense, you can also assume that, that what surrounds us in the three kingdoms of nature contains the most varied, the most intricately interwoven currents, and that what we know consciously of this world is but a small and superficial part of the whole. When we gain consciousness of this fact, we must confront the world and say, quote, with our soul content, with our ordinary consciousness, we know but the smallest part of the being that is man. What I have stated in a simple, easy sentence will become one day a difficult and profound fact for the consciousness of the man who is striving after supersensible knowledge. So I guess I think there was a close quote there, but it, it, isn't, uh, it wasn't there. Okay, sorry. Let me read that again. Quote, with our soul content, with our ordinary consciousness, we know but the smallest part of the being that is man. I think there's a close quote there. What I have stated in this simple, easy sentence will become one day a difficult and profound fact for the consciousness of the man who is striving after supersensible knowledge. He will suddenly realize, quote, yes, in all you have so far known, you have really only hidden things from yourself. You have covered things up more than unveiled them, close quote. And he stands in all his human weakness confronting the wonders of the cosmos. That he is not powerless when conscious of this, that he finds within him the confidence to fight through, described in the preceding lecture, embraces the whole sphere of what one may call soul testings. Strong, forceful energy, hope and trust bring the soul through every test, for through these the soul is able to confront everything that we can describe as a cosmic wonder, and the universe presents us with still more and more wonders the more we win through to the supersensible worlds. As with every fresh cosmic wonder, we are faced with some new unknown. We shall, always, we shall also always be confronted with fresh tests. In the small affairs of ordinary life, it would be a test, for example, if we had to come to know someone for a time and had thought that he was even as he appeared to us, and he suddenly showed himself to be quite different. We might then either fall away from him, or we might lead our soul past this point and remain true to him. We should then, in a way, have stood the test of friendship. There are also tests with regard to the wonders of the cosmos. In all that our souls have gained in ideas and feelings, we stand with regard to cosmic wonders because we are moving forward in front of a world that changes and because we are always seeing further and further into this world, there is always something new before us and we are always having to say afresh to ourselves, quote, what we have seen so far is Maya, close quote. Doubt may then assail us the mood may arise that makes us say, quote, you have pressed forward too quickly, close quote. just as in the last scene but one of the Rosicrucian drama, The Soul's Probation. Johannes Tomasius says to himself that so far he had made a certain picture in his mind of Lucifer, according to the development of his own soul. This, however, is only a picture, a phantom. As he progresses, Lucifer appears to him in a far more comprehensive way and he has to return in order that he may learn to know him in his fullness, not as a phantom as hitherto. So also can he, who has pushed forward to what is for him a certain stage of clairvoyance, push on still further and say to himself, quote, What I have so far attained is still nothing but phantom, but image. It must become more dense. Close quote. Because we are always pressing forward, we are continually faced with fresh formations of the world. We must bring the strong forces of the soul into these fresh conformations. Then our soul will stand the tests and will continually be able to receive fresh spiritual revelations. Every time a new spiritual revelation comes, a new trial of soul will have to be endured.
At each separate stage of development, new tests arise, and it is precisely in the fact that our soul need never make an end, but can undertake ever higher and perhaps more difficult tests, that we have to recognize the impulse to all higher development. Spiritual revelations are never absent when the soul is able to endure those trials, which perhaps only after long periods furnish what is necessary for it to rise through trials. Thus we see how such trials are the impulse to upward striving, and how spiritual revelations are those soul-satisfying things that ever come to us from above. Consequently, we must certainly not consider that point as an end which can be attained at one stage, and which is represented, for example, in our first Rosicrucian drama. We should make a mistake if we were to regard it as an end. A person can be very far advanced in seeing pictures of the higher worlds, and yet one day he may find that he has seen only pictures, not realities. He is then confronted with the severe soul test before which Johannes Tomasius stands when the second Rosicrucian drama ends. He is then aware that what he has beheld was a picture, that he had by no means sufficiently learned to know reality on the physical plane so as to be able to fill out his picture with reality. Then such trials approach his soul that he is bound to ask, How can I develop those strong forces within me that shall enable me to give content to what in the first place is only a picture? We must therefore clearly understand that we must not shrink from trials of the soul, for with each reorganization of the world that approaches we have again to endure trials. To avoid such trials would be the death of true spiritual life. We must realize it. it is our duty to endure these trials of the soul because they strengthen us to force our way into the spiritual world.